So welcome again, uh, for the benefit of the recording joining us. Um, we are, as, a, as you know now, uh, recording this evening's session, and we will be emailing the links to the recording, uh, all of the slides and the chat from this evening's session um, to everyone who was booked in the next day or two. Um, so there's no need to make notes tonight unless you particularly want to. Um, and we would love to see you. It's really, really nice to be able to see everyone who is listening out there, um, see who it is that's asking these questions. Um, so if you are comfortable to do so, um, please do keep your camera on. Um, just remember that we are recording this evening's session. Um, so Zoom these days doesn't actually put your name on the recording, but it may capture your video. Um, so that is it from me. Um, I will hand over now to Sean, who will start uh, the tour of his whole House 1960s retrofit. Thank you, Sean. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, to the tour. And bear with me, because uh, I have never presented on Zoom before. I, well, if I'm used to the technology, I've just not done this. So let's let's go. Now I'm going to use a technology in Zoom Mixer in beta, so it may take a, a few moments to start up, but I'll need to do it straight away. So right. So as I've put here, so we bought this 1960s house in 2011, and um, when we first moved in, we, it was just before winter and it was a very cold run at that. And, and so we wanted to um, make our house a little bit warmer and cheaper to run because it cost us a fortune that winter. Um, and so it was really, this is an accidental journey on, um, on an eco retrofit. <clears throat> um, to give you a flavor of, of what was actually happening here, is uh, that this house was built in 1962 and over the years it had very little done to it it still had its original boiler when i bought it um it had some double glazing in the early 70s the really micro thin stuff um added in the early 70s along with um, um a bay window which was very poorly done but that other than that it was not changed at all so shortly after we moved in we decided Right, let's see what, what money savings we can do. Let's make this a bit warmer. So the first thing we did was add solar panels, which um, at the time was obviously, um, at that time, there was a lot going on because of the government grants were really good. And, the, and then shortly after that, we had the cavity wall just before the following winter, I think it was. Um, and that made such a difference. So we started looking at other things and how we can reduce our costs. So mild hybrid cars um, but when I started looking into things um, so things like the extract fans for bathrooms it became obvious that I didn't want to evacuate all this lovely hot air although it's full of moisture but okay we can reclaim that and I knew there was reclaiming options and I started looking into this and the more I looked into it, the more I realized this was going to be a major retrofit. And so I contacted um, a local builder, drew up the plans myself, submitted plan of permission myself, and then got engineering help, et cetera, to sort that. And it was the builder who actually said, actually, you're going to save money by ripping it all out and starting again. So I did. Um, and that's where the journey started. But there was a limit to, to the uh, finances, so we did it all in bits. And as you can see here, it's been spread over time. And this year, as you can see just above my head, I've fitted a house battery. Yeah, and uh, we moved down to a single car. I have sort of uh, written up a little bit here so that people who, who download this later on can actually read what I'm speaking about. Um, but I'm not going to go reading through this right now um, in detail uh, just to get a flavor is um, at the time I had two young children when I started then we became special guardians for a third so I really had to do something about the house at the time and so so we did <clears throat> so 
So what have I actually done? Yeah, well, we ripped out all the internals, including the staircase, all the walls. This made it, and all the plasterboard and everything else, which made it easier for the builders and the constructors, things like um, the sparkies, electricians, and plumbers, they all dropped their price because <clears throat> it was easy access to the ceilings and the uh, walls. You could run the two and a half inch pipe for the MVHR, you could run all the electrics, and they dropped their prices pretty significantly, about 2,000 each. So, and it was nothing like, um, and it actually dropped the price oddly, it dropped the price of the plasters as well, um, because they, they find it easier to plaster a fresh board. So it saved a lot of money, it, strangely, although I didn't like the waste of all the materials, um, but it, it, was, it was about, I think, three or four thousand pounds less just by doing that. So we literally started with the grounds up, did the PV, did the solar thermal, MVHR, all of these items, we've basically attached to everything. The only things we haven't really done, I'll, I'll deal with later on, I'll talk about later. Now, but we did try and reduce the waste as well. So even the waste coming out of the house, you'll see later on, I've reused a lot of it as much as I possibly could. So, you know, start with the solar. Now, obviously, at the very top of the house, you can see I've got 18 panels. Um, that's just photovoltaic, so that gives you the electricity. That was put on as soon as I could possibly could on the house to reduce the electricity. That has been such a boon. It's been really good. Um, it has a number of advantages. Um, it even keeps the loft cool in summer. It's some of the secondhand advantages have been quite amazing. And the, and the on the lower roof, you'll see the tubes. So that's um, hot water and they're vac vacuum tubes with a copper plate inside, which is painted like a bluey black for maximum absorption. And that provides enough hot water through majority of the year for all five of us. And so we get about 210 litres. Around this time of year, we get about 210 litres in a day. Today was, was full, um, plus the battery was full. So it's, it is amazing how much all this generates. Um, now those, those um, solar panels are plugged in, obviously, to um, all kinds of things around the consumer unit. So I can then monitor and divert to various items, which I'll come to later. Um, the only the only thing I would say is the PV is absolutely fantastic. I, I can't understand why everybody hasn't got it. It's just a no brainer. It has zero maintenance. It just generates power. The, the solar tubes, on the other hand, they're great. They produce lots of hot water and you can even heat your house with them. Um, we haven't got enough tubes to do that. Uh, but there is a cost in maintaining them. Because as you see, there's some little pipes coming out of the back. Obviously, that goes into your hot system. And that needs to be maintained a bit like um, your air conditioning in your car or your heating. It needs maintenance. And so there is a maintenance cost in running those. Yes, they save money. And I'll come across the figures later on in the presentation. Um, but there is the downside of maintaining that pump and the coolant. They maintain it every two years, they recommend. Uh, but it's all amazingly effective. So I work from home now, as a lot of people do, and virtually everything is now powered from home. Um, I run during the day. The heating comes um, from solar gain and from the um, tubes, and the uh, PV provides all the electric. Um, but my personal preference is I would have put more PV on the house and then diverted and powered the um, and heated the water from the PV electricity. Um, <clears throat> so if you're going to do it, just put as many panels on as you can for PV uh, and then have diverts and 
clever utilities like that because that has been the best by far over the last 11 years. Now, <clears throat> to give you a flavor of quite how, how good these are, and obviously the time of year uh, it affects it. So the solar thermal <clears throat> heats the bottom part of the tank. Um, so the cold water coming into the house, uh, it then heats that as much as it can. And um, today it pretty much heated that entire tank. The gas boiler then just it acts as a booster to it, but it very rarely cuts in. But the, the chart on the left will give you a flavor of what summer and winter differences it makes. So throughout the day, so that's a single day. And you can see how cold it was and where the, so where the sun is. And you can see normally by about two o'clock, um, we have a full tank of um, 210 litres of hot water. Um, but in winter, it doesn't quite make it. Uh, although you can see that the water we get is normally about 40 degrees most of the, most of the year round. So even the worst winter, we've had um, rather than the water comes in about 10 degrees centigrade. So rather than that, the gas boiler, all it's got to do is heat from 40 degrees to 60, which is not a huge great leap. And it, so it saves a lot of gas, about 200 pounds worth of gas a year in total is saved. And this is PV. So there's a day in June this year, July this year, and you can see on the graph on the top, you'll see the um, yellow line, and the yellow line is uh, the sun and the, the electricity generated by the sun. The blue line is what the house is used, and the grey line at the bottom is just the two added together. So you can see if it goes negative, it's exporting to the grid. Um, in this particular example, the peak in the very beginning of the day, that's making a cup of tea and waking up in the morning. But uh, the rest is actually charging the car. So I charge my electric car, and you can see it charged throughout the day, and that put about half a battery in. So that's something like 80 or 90 miles. And in the evening, that's cooking um, peaks. And then the bottom graph is a bar graph showing you um, how it works over the, throughout the year. And you can see by the yellow bar, how little you get in the winter, but you still get some. And, and you export, the green is the exported. Um, and so I've now added the battery, which will take that green and put it above the line. Yeah, the, the system I've got is a 4.2 kilowatt. Um, I've seen it about 4.1, but it's very rare you get anything that high. So the bigger the system you can get, the better. Having all that spare power, I suddenly realized that running a fan for an MBHR would also be um, easily deal, dealt with by the PV. So like I was uh, uh, alluding to uh, earlier on, um, we wanted extract fans and we needed extract fans on um, the bathrooms. We have three of them. So it's needed to be extracted somehow and I wanted to reclaim all that heat. So it all it became very evident that it, buying a separate unit for each and every room was going to get costly. So actually, I might as well just do the whole house. So I did. Actually, by far, this is the best addition to the house other than the PV. We would never have a house without this anymore. I can't believe that this isn't standard in the UK. It's standard in Canada. It's standard in the Netherlands. It's standard in Norway, Sweden. Not sure why it isn't in the UK. And actually, I found if you want the parts for it, go to those countries and you can get a massive discount because they're a lot cheaper. And we've had no, no issue with it, absolutely none, no noise, no nothing, no disadvantages, just advantages. It's the impact on life is incredible. Um, can't recommend it more, really. There's no, no mold, no nothing. And we dry clothes indoors, no more tumble drying um, and I filter everything. So um, it's all hypoallergenic. We have 
um, all the uh, pollen filtered out. So the house, and it gets rid of a lot of the dust in the house as well. So it's, it is very good and it stabilizes the house temperature. So even today, my house is currently at 22 degrees um, and I've got no heating on, haven't had heating on at all. And it, it, but that's the MVHR doing that and reclaiming it. Ooh. I wasn't going to move on to batteries yet. What did I do? What was I doing better? Excuse me, want to try and work out my plan. So where did I find the space to run? Is um, it's actually in the loft, exactly like this picture. So my MVHR is literally seen in the loft space, um, and the the ducting etc. goes down inside the walls, as you can see in this picture and along in between the um, joists. So it, you, you literally can't see the pipes anywhere. All right, I'm sure as, as we've got a little bit of time, I'll carry on. Um, yeah, the, the MVHR is, <laughs> it was quite hard to fit in. And retrofit, you do need to. So, if you've got solid walls, I, I took out some solid walls to put stud work in um, where I needed to root it. And we went through um, between the joists in most floors. There's a lot of pipe work. So, to give you a clue of how much is in this house, there's eight, um, eight pipes going in and eight pipes going out. So, so, one to each room, and some rooms have double like kitchen. And it just, a lot of pictures showing, it evacuates kitchen and bathrooms, any wet area. So it includes our utility room where we dry stuff. And then it pushes it into bedrooms and living spaces. And uh, I've actually, with a bit of thought, I actually positioned it so that it blew down on um, radiators. So when the heating does come in, it helps um, circulate the warm air. So we realized after a considerable time, you, do, you don't get a lot of money, you get very little return on the um, exported electricity. So you're best using as much as possible. So that's exactly what we did. Um, you can see on the top right hand corner picture, there's a little zappy and that diverts into the car. So we've been charging the car and we get about 50% of our car mileage off the um, solar panels and the 50% from the grid. But you can see, you saw by the previous bar chart, we exported a fair bit. So I thought, oh, I'm going to capture that and put it into the battery. And this is what you see on the left hand side, the inverter at the top and the battery at the bottom. It's, it's surprising how effective it is. And it is, uh, so today that battery is fully charged, even though it was pretty mixed day. Um, and I managed to put um, about 18 miles worth into the car as well. Um, so it goes to the battery on the, ha the house battery first, and then it goes to the car. In an emergency, these will actually cut over and run the house. Um, so if you lose power, uh, that this particular inverter is actually designed so you can, you have to manually switch it over to run the house. And the idea is just to use everything possibly can. I also have some small uh, low wattage heaters in the house. So they're you know, like 100 watt to 300 watt switched. And sometimes I use any spare power just to give a little bit of heat into the house, meaning I don't have to run the gas, but only where there's spare for the PVs generating. Right, I'm, at this point, I was going to hand over to um, for questions because I can see there's been a, a few pop up. Um, so, should we have some questions now? Sure. I mean, um, yeah, I, I can open it. I think that's been the questions that have come up. Uh, you've addressed about accommodating the uh, MPHR pipe work. 
So I think that's covered. Okay. Ah, uh, there's one from Penny. How much was the house battery? Ah, right. The cost of the battery. Yes. Now that's surprisingly low. So that entire installation on the left was three thousand two hundred. Um, the type, I don't know what the type is, um, but the size is uh, four point eight kilowatt battery. Um, I thought I'd start with that to see how I go. Um, so far, I think I've probably underestimated the the company that installed it. Estimated that I'd say four hundred and fifty a year. I think that's rubbish. I, I, I think I'm going to save about three hundred and fifty. Um, but actually, I think the battery should have been bigger. And it was done. Uh, it was bought from the company, the company that um, the council set up. There was a big solar thing that went round, and I just went in with that and said, "I'll have the battery only, not the panels." And they came around and did it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happily share their share their details. <laughs> the MVHR, now that yes, <laughs> yeah, the MVHR is quite a costly item. The whole thing costs about eight and a half thousand pounds. Um, I would still do it tomorrow that is worth every penny you don't save a lot of money with it um, probably a few hundred a year but it's it just makes the house so much more livable um and yes it was quite quite a bit of work <laughs> getting that in i think there's a particular question there from uh dave about improving air tightness yeah sorry yeah i missed that um the air tightness i did and some of the tricks to air tightness are, um, so when we rebuilt the house, we put the uh, the sockets, so power sockets and anything that goes on the walls, we put on internal walls as much as possible. Where it went on the external wall, I actually just went inside and smeared silicon sealant inside it to stop any air tightness into the, into the boxes. We did an air tightness test. It's not brilliant on the house, but that wasn't my target. Um, and so the MVHR is set to um, its highest leakage. We've also got a cat flap and that's fairly leaky, although I've done my best to um, reduce that. And yes, I've done a lot of air tightness around light fittings and various other bits, but I've not gone to town with it because my, it wasn't my target to to get to passive house standard. It was just to make it more livable, more livable. Right. There's I don't. There's quite a lot of questions coming in now. This is a uh, so there's one from I don't know if you can see all these. There's a few questions from I Stephen. Can't, no. Okay. So then questions from Stephen Roxanne, which is um, do you have special qualifications that make it easier for you to complete complete the planning process? Um, no. <laughs> so um, so. I am a qualified engineer. Um, so I originally qualified as an electrical engineer, but I moved into IT. So I'm actually an IT manager. Um, so none of this is my core qualification. I just read up about it, looked into it, and I knew, because I was a parish councillor at one point, I knew you could submit your own plans. So I drew the whole thing in Word, would you believe, under the grid matrix. Um, and as long as you, I know, don't, don't laugh. <laughs> um, as long as you display your scale, they have to accept it as a, um, a, a valid application. And they granted me full permission to do all this on a Word document. <laughs> <laughs> um, did I enjoy it? Oh God, yeah. <laughs> it, was <great> fun. <laughs> it was challenging. Um, I've had to trying to find somebody with MVHR experience in this country is just hell. Um, so I, I did a lot of that myself. Um, I found a company in, um, in Holland who are fantastic and I will share their details with you if you ever do this. They supply me my filters, they supply all the details free of charge um, and videos on how to do things. I maintain and clean the MVHR myself in he showed me, this guy showed me how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they are incredibly good, this, this, this company, and they, they're significantly cheaper than anybody in the UK. Um, sure, I think, sorry, that just a, 
there's a question also about is are you going to be covering insulation there's quite a few questions about you know uh, connections between you know double glazing triple glazing external installation i'll come on to that um yeah so okay. double glazing and insulation uh, in the next section right um i just thought that um pv yeah. and batteries and solar yeah. okay would, so, have, would generate enough so i get yeah so hopefully a lot of those questions there that are in the chat will get covered um i'll just have a quick look um, so, so we've yeah. So the installation of MVHR, that was that the same company that you're referring to the the actual um, installation itself. The, no, the installation of the MVHR was done by a plumber who is the cousin of um, Matt Salmon, the builder. <laughs> um, he'd done it, and the reason I used him, he had done it twice before, but never on a, a residential. So he had done it on a commercial premises. And a lot of shops have these MVHR systems already in. So you really got to go to the commercial side. And the, uh, I've done a lot of that. I've, so some of this retrofit, et cetera, I've had to go commercial rather than residential. Um, the solar vac tubes, as you probably saw, that they're horizontally mounted rather than vertically. Yeah, they don't offer that residentially, so I had to do a commercial installation. Um, but it didn't, it's no more money, it's just they, they don't normally offer it to residentials. Strange. Um, and the builder did all the work with um, plastering, uh, removal of the plaster, etc., and then subcontracted out the plaster. And the MVHR unit is a hinder. Um, I'm sorry, there's a question here about did you consider a heat pump? I'm that's in my uh, right oh, at the end. That's, that's right at the end. Um, sorry, okay. I'll, I'll cover that right at the end. Um, right. But yes, I still have a gas boiler. It is is one of the latest um, condensing boilers. But in winter, so come November, this house is not. It still needs some heat to to heat it up. And at the moment, I'm still using gas boilers, but that my wife and I are talking about what we do about that. Um, so I'm still on this journey. Little bit by little bit, we're changing everything. Uh, and that's one of the next projects. Um, I've done a lot of investigation and I'll, I'll chat about that in a bit. I think uh, we're coming nearly to, uh, nearly to the end of our sort of halfway chat time, I think. Um, okay. There was just one last bit about did, did the solar panels get in the way of other renovation activities actually that's a that's a good point i forgot to mention that so one of the renovation was removing all the chimneys so i had two chimneys in this house they were in the way of the solar panels um but actually we found that running a live fire in the in a living room you found a draft at the bottom because it sucks the oxygen from the room and you have to have um an air brick or something to feed the fire. And so we decided, right, that's it, we're getting rid of the chimney. And the chimney made space for where the staircase is now. And that then made space for the um, PV to go on the roof. So yes, we got rid of all of that. So the roof space was clear. Uh, but, there <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's amazing how bad chimneys are as drafts and they are one of the biggest causes of um, cold in a house and you're best blocking them up <laughs> or getting rid of them entirely and actually getting rid of them saves a lot of space in the middle of the house they are substantial and we say that like i said where that is where the staircase where the chimney was is where the staircase is now so i didn't lose any internal space but i gained where the staircase was So in prior to David, um, I didn't get the fit. Um, so the way I did it, I didn't have the money at the time. So I leased my roof and they paid for the installation. So I'm regretting that because I wish I had got the fit payments because that would have been brilliant. Um, but you don't lose those payments when you fit the battery. That one I did investigate anyway, because I knew that question would come up. So. Yes, in importing it, you because you lose the payments you get exporting to the grid, but they're tiny, they're pennies, but you still get the payments of the generation from the fiat payments. So yes, it, it pays big time. And I estimate even 
get my lower figures so the battery will pay for itself within um, six years. Right, I think I think that's the end of our halfway point. Just that. okay. I shall move on, then. especially as some of those questions were relating to double glazing. <laughs> so, yes, I ripped out all the double glazing. The original double glazing was terrible. It was drafty. Um, it was wooden. Although I have no problem with wood, I actually think it's wood is actually a very good framework. But that's my personal opinion. I replaced glazing with um, traditional double glazing. I did try and go triple, um, but I was persuaded otherwise. If you have a really good quality double, it's not that much um, worse than triple. You don't gain a lot with triple. Um, so, and with triple glazing, you don't get the options for what you can see in front of you now. Um, so, Having the, having the blinds inside, so internal glazed um, blinds is fantastic. They open and close with sliding doors and you don't have any dusting. But during the summer, it stops the radiation. So the, the inside of the window stays fairly cool. Um, so one of the problems with eco houses is in the summer, they can get too damn hot because you can't get rid of the heat. So all the south facing windows, I put this interglazed blinds, blinds, makes a fantastic difference and keeps the house cooler. Um, but also strangely has the same effect in winter. It also keeps it warmer because it stops the, you see by the picture on the right hand side, it stops the air circulating inside the, between the two glazed um, pieces of glazing. So it reduces the, the movement of the gases inside. Um, and so actually these interglazed blinds, blinds are, are fantastic. They are, uh, they're guaranteed for like 15 years. Um, and the ones you're seeing in front are, are, are French are sliding doors, patio doors, which slide with it and they're brilliant. But they're manual ones and you can see the, like the runner on the inside of the glass. If you go for electric, you lose that entirely and they, they disappear into the frame. And I've done that on the on other windows in the house. Um, on the, it's surprising how cheap it is as well. So the cost is, um, on these ones that are in the picture, they were about 25% more than a standard pat, uh, set of patio doors. Um, so that's, that's a, an increase of 25%. The electric ones were an increase of about 40%. Um, and you can pull the blinds completely up. So there's a little magnet that runs along that runner. On the left hand side, it tilts it. On the right hand side, you can pull it right up or right down. So it disappears and the electric ones just disappear into the frame. Um, and the, ele yeah, the electric ones come with uh, their battery powered. Otherwise you'd have to run wires to them. So they're actually controlled by, um, infrared controller so you can I can hit a button well actually it's radio controller not infrared because I can hit a button and all of them close in the house together um, or I can close one room at a time so theoretically you could put a timer on that I think there is a timer on the controller um, and you can you can mix and match you can change the blind position and all sorts they're, they're pretty damn clever uh, so yeah we're very we're very pleased with them so that they're worth where they're worth it, the investment as for insulation yes i have insulated the house i've i've done so slightly differently so two sides of the house i extended because we needed the extra bedroom <coughs> because we could, became special guardians um and so on the left hand side you see what we've done with the the breeze block is thermally efficient breeze block it's um the low thermal emission stuff um, I can't remember the term for it, <coughs> but um, so that's good in its own right. And then there's the two inches of um, um, foil coated foam, uh, and then the brick on the outside with a, an air gap. That's extremely good, actually. The, the walls are very warm. And when we had the winter the other day, the other year, we were down to minus 15. You could put your hand on the wall 
and it would feel warm to the touch. Um, and that's even with only heating in the room. So it's not the warmth of the wall you're feeling, it is literally the insulation is so good. As for the loft, that was complicated because we don't, we have a very shallow pitch, as you can probably see in the right hand side. Um, so I can't even kneel up in, in the loft. It's tight. But actually, it was Matt, the builder, who suggested, say, just leave the fiberglass between the beams and just put so, um, Celotex, so the solid foam on top. I was quite surprised because um, I thought, well, will it take the weight? Yes, it does. Uh, as long as you put boards to spread the weight, um, the other that we, we put, you can see there's in the corner, there's um, stuff stored on it. Um, and we kneel on it, it's, it doesn't move. It's so it's literally like a floating floor sitting on uh, about three inches of Celotex, which is on top of the fiberglass. And but just to add to that, because well, the floorboards themselves act as an insulator as well, but to add to that. You can see I've done in the on, on the actual um, the rafters themselves. I've put um, this thin insulation, and uh, this is the um, what they call multi-foil insulation, um, which is very very efficient. And what that effectively does is creates a semi-warm loft. So although I've, I've insulated everything to the nth degree. I've also created a semi-warm loft because the MVHR is in there and I was worried about thermal loss from the MVHR. We have insulated the MVHR boxes and pipes. Uh, they are they come insulated anyway, even what you're seeing there. They're, they're double walled um, and they come like that. But then I've now put even more around them and when they come out of those box, they disappear underneath the loss of insulation now. <clears throat> but they're all covered by this, um, this, uh, these multifoil. And the rest of the house, well, yeah, I've covered your wall insulation where there was fascia boards, we removed them and put um, the foam, the, fire, the foil foam um, from Celotex <clears throat> on top of it. But even where we did, um, where we got external walls that were just cavity walled, we decided to put thicker wallpaper and we've actually ordered special pictures. So we've got huge murals right across uh, rooms, which look awesome. And they come in really, really thick paper, which help insulate as well. And as I put here, power sockets, mostly on internal walls, where it is on outside, I've lined it. But I've literally, when I say I lined it, I pulled the socket out. I've got a load of um, silicon seal and just completely coated it in silicon seal with my finger with a glove. Because you'll be amazed at how much draft you get through um, the sockets, because they've been drilled into breeze block and they are very drafty, so they've all been sealed. <clears throat> but very, very cheaply. <laughs> Where we are now. <clears throat> so this picture I pulled from a, a Dutch um, academic who was doing comparisons on, on where houses were actually in Holland. And I thought actually this is quite a nice little graphic of, of where things are. And I, I've worked out the points are actually um, where the numbers are. So passive house aims at 15, so that's where the point is. And zero is on the right hand side and 25 because there's a different passive house standard and I think somebody else is doing that with the NG fit um, presentation is about 25 so that blue bit is 25 to zero and low is from 25 up to um, I can't remember what, what the figure was but it's uh, it's about some 80 odd so I'm well and truly into the low so my head's in the way um, if I move my personage out of the way so over the last few years, yeah, we've done 20, uh, 60 kilowatt per meter squared. A five bedroom house, that's pretty damn good. Um, yes, I'm not passive house. I'd have to go to spend a lot of money to get it any much better than this. But looking at the government figures, the latest figures they published, 
brand new houses are still 125 kilowatts. So I'm well over double what a brand new house is. That's appalling. I can't believe they're allowing that to happen. Um, why would a new house be a, such a poor condition? Um, I don't know, but that's, that's their official figures. So we're well over double. <clears throat> um, if you're interested, um, Holland, their standard for new builds is not much better. It's 120 kilowatts from their government. <laughs> so, we're, so we're not alone in the UK for that. <clears throat> um, but that 60 kilowatts per meter square, that's with the entire family working from home. So that's during this pandemic. Um, so all five of us were in the house throughout that. So it gives you a clue. Um, we did have our heating on a bit more than we would normally because we were all at home. We were using electricity. So I'm very pleased with the 60 kilowatt, although I'd like to find that 60 kilowatt elsewhere. So reusing materials, so snapshot of my garden. Um, you can see the bricks, now all those bricks were reclaimed or left over from the build. The greenhouse goes down a meter below that. I when they were digging out the foundations to the house, I got them to just dig a bit further for free. Um, and so all the spare um, hardcore went underneath their stones and stuff as a heat store below the greenhouse. The bricks, I've laid them all myself. They're reclaimed. We reclaimed from um, the house. So my wife, myself, my son had many a day knocking with a cold chisel, knocking cement off so the brickies could reuse them in the house or re and I could use them in the garden. And the slabs sit on top of all the rubble in the greenhouse. I re slabbed the top of the garden underneath the chicken run. So I reused as much as I possibly could. Uh, but that gives you a clue of uh, how much I've done. And you can see the old glazing. So the greenhouse I made from the old glazing from the house. So that's the double glazing that was pulled from the house and I, I used it and I built it after they completed. And uh, I know Alana likes the fact that I put the cat, the cat flap and yeah, just uh, anecdotally, the cat flap in the house goes into the greenhouse and then the cat has to come out of the greenhouse. So therefore I don't lose too much heat because I have any leaks to a sort of hot area. <laughs> and that stays, that stays hot all year round and grow as much veg as I possibly can in that little space. And then we've switched to electric completely. So <clears throat> electric cars, uh, bikes, lawnmower, everything we have, we've got rid of fuel entirely. The only thing I'm using at the moment is the gas boiler, which we're looking at. Um, the electric cars just been fantastic. And when we go to the figures, I'll, I'll explain a bit more. Um, but we bike a lot. Um, the electric lawnmower has been fantastic. Yes, they all cost to set up, but they save money in the long run. And we would never, ever go back to a non-electric car. It's just been fantastic and saved so much money. Uh, and when, when you've got solar panels, it's even better. <laughs> Half of my mileage. I mean, we had two EVs and we put... One year we put 8,000 miles of electric from the solar panels alone. So yes, that was a sunny year, <laughs> but it gives you a clue of how much it can be. Now these are the real figures. So these are all based on last two years. So they're averaged over the last two years and gives you an idea of um, the kind of money I'm spending. So it's a five bed house, it's a big house. So 150 square meters um, around that. So it's, it's a large area. And we spent just over a thousand pounds on gas and electric. But do bear in mind that gas and electric includes running two electric cars on it. So if you were having a fuel car, you'd have to add all your petrol costs on top of that. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, where did I live? <laughs> yeah. We moved out for three months while the major stuff was done. But yes, we've lived throughout it through all this disruption. Um, but I've, we've cleverly managed it as much as we possibly could um, and done little bits. So do one corner, then the next, then the next. 
Um, the MHR, yes, it saves about £100 a year, but it's a massive cost. It wasn't about it, and it, it costs about 50 quid a year for filters and that to keep it running. The electric car, look at the savings. I had a cash guy and then bought a Leaf, so that that literally is a comparison of running a, a diesel cash guy um, to uh, buying our Leaf. We saved £3,200 per car per year. Um, just we're running that so it very quickly paid for itself and we've bought a new one with the money we've saved the cavity wall if everyone knows about that that's a big big saving i estimate that's about 200 pound a year drop in the gas cost from that and the zappy charger yeah saving you about 200 pound electric going into the uh, car um and I didn't know whether people were aware the government does give grants for putting um, charges on walls. Um, and you get about 500 quid from the government for installing an EV charger. And the photovoltaics were leased, so um, they didn't cost me anything, but they save about 200 pounds of electric. But the battery will, will make that up. Yeah, the supplier said 430. I reckon it's going to be more like 350, according to my calculations. I think they were just overzealous with it. But either way, that pays back very quickly. Um, <clears throat> and you see from the solar thermal, the fact tubes, they save quite a bit as well. But it costs about 75, 150 pounds servicing every two years, so 75 pounds a year. Yeah, but really, uh, whilst, whilst I like figures, I don't, I don't like this um, payback. Um, so people are always saying, will it pay me back? Uh, a lot of this is, is not about getting the money back. For me, it wasn't. It's all about um, quality of life and what we should be doing rather than the, how much money I'll save. And actually, the house is so much nicer to live in once I've done this. Um, it just feels better. And you can see the costs are tumbling. And that, that 600 quid is paying for all my car as well. It's just... It's amazing to run and it's cheap to run. In hindsight, what I would what I wouldn't do is do the solar thermal. Yeah, it it just about balances um, with the cost of running it to the amount you're saving and, and the amount you've had to pay out. Actually, you're better at just getting heat pumps and solar, solar PV. Um, I should have done more with uh, thermal bridging. Um, I, I, got Tom to teach me about um, thermal cameras and I can see where my thermal bridging is, is needs work and I will be doing that and more air tightness and I slowly going through that as well I found little areas which are little pockets where I've missed and I'm going to probably put another set of PV on just need more um, and the roof yeah, and the location of all the, the equipment, I think I could have planned it a bit better. It works fine, but I would have planned it a bit better and put it probably somewhere a little bit more accessible. I understand it all, but and my son does, but my wife doesn't. She understands most of it, but it is quite complicated. There's quite a setup. And so I would, I would make it a bit easier. Going forward, yes, I'm going to replace that gas heating. That's our target. I've looked into heat pumps, um, both air and um, ground ground source, extortionately expensive. I've even spoken to a company about doing all my neighbours and all of us together. You don't get much of a benefit, even scaling up, um, and it saves about a thousand a house. Um, but the air heat source heat pumps are terribly inefficient when you go below zero. Uh, they do work now below zero, as they didn't before. But you may as well have a bar heater on from what I can see. Whereas the ground source, it's a totally different mindset. It's very expensive to install, but you get unlimited heat for no cost. And talking to an engineer who installed one, it costs about £2.50 of electric to run a year. And that's it. No other costs. And so they're incredibly, they're almost free to run throughout the year. Uh, so they, I'm just wondering, can can I afford going that far? Because it's about twenty six thousand pounds to install the ground source heat pump. 
which is a lot. And I'm not sure. More PV, more cooling. Ground source heat pump does cooling. So it may solve to fix the thermal bridges and in, increase the insulation in the areas which I can see have uh, got the um, thermal bridging and, and other issues. And I'm looking at ridge blades as well, which is where you replace the very top of the ridge with um, wind turbines. And um, if anybody's interested, I can share. And that's, that's it for me. And I think I've gone into question time, but. Uh, that's, yeah, that's okay. I, there were a couple of minutes in, but I think, um, I, yeah, that's, thanks very much, Sean. It's fascinating stuff. I'm just going to call out a couple of questions that ended up in uh, chat. So there's, uh, Danielle is asking a question about the, I think about the graph that shows the energy use. Was the, was the annual usage there divided by the total floor area? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, you, you, to get the figures is, um, and to get that, uh, that 60 kilowatts, that's the total amount of kilowatt heating, space heating I use, divided by the square meterage of, um, of your property. And if, you, if you're interested in that particular and where you sit on that one, um, literally just measure the outside of your house if you're two stories, double it, and then divide by how much you pay for your gas or whatever you're heating with. Um, and that'll give you a rough figure of where you sit on there. Um, right. I think at this point, then, we, uh, if anybody would like to unmute themselves, to, if they've got a question they'd like to ask, I think you can feel free, or if you prefer, just put it in the chat. Um, I think there's a question there from Anne. And the air-to-air -air heat pump. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my MVHR, the Zahinda, can, can be integrated with both the ground source and air-to-air, -air, um, but the efficiency um yeah it's better to the air to air so i'm i'm looking at but i haven't looked into that as yet i've done the air to water and that looks terrible um and the ground source to the mvhr looks fantastic but yeah you're right I'll, i need to look at the air to air does anybody else have any questions i think uh did i miss one from okay how much monitoring on the load um Makes my, <laughs> makes my wife laugh. So I have something called an eco eye, which monitors all my power um, and solar generation. Uh, that's also uploaded to an online database on the web. The battery also has its own database, which uh, goes to the web. Smart meter uploads to the web, so I can compare all of them and make sure they're all tying up. Uh, and then obviously the gas, I just monitor by the smart meter. I think there's a question from Stephen Roxanne about the where would you ideally locate the plant equipment? I guess that's for a heat pump. Yeah, I would try and locate it. So the battery, you have to lo locate it um, away from the house as much as possible because it's potentially explosive if you get things wrong in battery. So you're supposed to keep it out of the house. But the MVHR, you really want it in the envelope of the house because you've got hot air going in and out of it. So if you can, You'd be best to put that in there. Um, and the same goes for the hot water tank, etc. trying to keep it in the envelope of the house. I did with the hot water. Um, I just didn't with the MBR char, I didn't have enough room. And the company that did the blinds, um, that's Polar Glaze um, down the road in Cottenham. And they, they source it from a Germany company. So I just went to Polar Glaze and said, can you do this? And they said, oh yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the right way, Alana. <laughs> so the Polar Glaze guys are fantastic. They've always been good. And if you ever have a problem, they're out like a shot. So I wanted to use them. And they said, oh, yeah, our supplier can build those as well. So, so they can. And it's actually standard frames. It's, it's just standard piece of glazing with, um, with blinds in. So Anne has asked, um, have you looked at using a sun... Lamp for hot water. I'm, I'm not. I don't know what Sun M is. Uh, oh, oh, is that the um, where it diverts the electric? Yeah, that's what I was suggesting. If, if I didn't have the solar um, 
vacuums, I, I would have used that um, in preference and had more PV on my roof instead. And then uh, as the capacity of the battery, I think you, you did mention that. Uh, it's 4.8, yeah, 4.8 kilowatt. Right. Yeah, and they, I think that you can double that up to 9.6 by putting another pack in. Right. And I think I should, if there's no more questions, I'll hand over to Alana. Oh, does ground source. No, no, ground source works regardless of whether you're insulated or not. Um, the issue with insulation is whether you're going to get a government grant for anything. So um, I had to, to get my um, <clears throat> payments on my solar hot water. Um, I had to prove that it was insulated and I wasn't going to waste that heat. But I could have done it either way. And the same goes for ground size. And the, the space you need for ground source, <coughs> if you're going to do slinkies, massive, you need almost half an acre. But if you do the vertical bore, which is costing a lot of money, you just need, um, well, they have to be seven meters apart and they're about a meter wide. And so, yeah, we put it under your drive and they'll just put the drive back on top, which is what I'm going to do. Um. There's a question again from, uh, right, so from how much space do you need for, for ground source heat pumps? Yeah, that's what I was just answering. Oh, sorry, so, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so <clears throat> when they put boreholes in, um, <clears throat> you need, I needed two boreholes for the house this size. Um, you can probably get away with one with a three bed. Um, and they're about a meter wide in radius. So you can put them anywhere, uh, but they have to be seven meters apart if you have more than one. Um, so you could literally put one under your front door, one under the window next next to the front of the house, um, which is what a lot of people have been doing. If you can afford the £26,000 to have it done. <laughs> right. right, so I might, I, I might wrap things oh, up. I think if there are no more questions, I have just a few things. I'm going to, I'm actually going to take over screen sharing. So I, I think, I think you hopefully you should be able to see me now. Although I haven't got that wonderful overlay that Sean had going. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm learning something. I'll deploy that next time. <laughs> um, well, firstly, I'd just really like to say thank you, Sean, for um, such an interesting presentation. Um, and I mean, for for the benefit of, of everyone else, if you if you ever get the opportunity to go to um, live in person open eco home tours in the future, I would highly recommend going to see Sean's house. There were so many little details that um, he he didn't get to cover this evening. Um, I'm glad I'm glad he did mention the cat butt boat. Um, as he said, <laughs> it definitely is one of my favourite features. Um, but there are so many other interesting things, and Sean is so knowledgeable, as, and, and you only got a, a taste this evening, I think, of, of you know, um, all of the kind of love and attention that he's put into his home. Um, thank you also to Ian um, for all of your fantastic help monitoring the chat, um, keeping, keeping a hand on things. Um, I hope that you all tonight found it um, as interesting and as useful as I did. Um, if you have there are three things that you could do that would actually be really helpful um, to us here at, at Cambridge Carbon Footprint. Um, firstly, if you could please provide feedback. Um, so there is a really short um, feedback form, um, a little survey that we have, which helps us to evaluate um, the events that we run. Um, and that evaluation is really helpful for us when we're applying for funding to host these events. So it helps us um, to, to put these events on in the future. Um, secondly, if you haven't already, please do consider making a donation. Um, so thank you to all of those wonderful people who have already donated. Um, as a small charity, all of the funds that we receive go towards putting on events just like this one. Um, and, you know, all of the events that we run are really practically focused, helping people, um, whether that's at home or in their community or in their place of work to um, reduce carbon and to take action on climate change. And you know, as an organization of our size, every donation really does make a difference. So um, if you can consider making a donation, we would really appreciate it. Um, and finally, 
Um, if you can, please do help others find these events. Um, share your experience, um, how it's been this evening um, with our Open Eco Homes hashtag. Um, and one final slide. So if tonight has whet your appetite uh, and you're keen to find out more about retrofitting or you know, home energy, uh, there are some really, really great resources on the Cambridge Carbon Footprint website. Um, so there are, there's a whole page actually dedicated to getting you started on your own retrofit journey. Um, there are more Open Eco Homes tours and talks. So actually coming up later this week, um, there is a talk on Thursday on Smart Electrics uh, in your home um, and a talk on Friday on planning your retrofit. Um, so if you haven't seen those ones, they might be two that you would want to check out. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of um, over a decade's worth of Open Eco Homes case studies, um, including Sean's case study, which actually has a few more links in there. So if you, if you missed that, um, you can, can see that on Sean's event page um, for this talk. Uh, there's information on thermal imaging, which, which Sean mentioned there briefly as well, um, other tools to help you analyse your home and loads more uh, opportunities for taking action on energy and the environment. So um, do check out those links. Um, remember that you will be receiving an email in the next day or two um, with the links to the recording, the chat and these slides. Um, and so I think, I think that's it from me. Um, thank you again, Sean, um, for sharing your home and your journey, uh, Ian, for all your support and help tonight, and you all at home for all of your fantastic uh, questions and comments. Um, it's been really, really interesting and informative uh, for me, at least. Um, so one final reminder to just please fill in that survey. Um, please make a donation if you haven't already. Um, and thank you very much, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you.